so just a second just a second yeah it's it's okay yeah perfect so moving on to our next plenary session of the day plenary 2 for day 2 we have among us dr shumit mukherjee dr mukherjee had joined sachdeva college kolkata as a lecturer later he did some research in pharmaceuticals from aridus pharmaceuticals usa as a graduate intern he had been a teaching assistant at university of pacific stockholm usa for almost 6 years he holds a position of senior application uh, specialist at waters india private limited bangalore for some time then he joined thermo fisher scientific india private limited kolkata as the area sales manager specialized in sales and marketing in life science mass spectrometry and later he secured a position of product manager of the mumbai branch he is an experienced sales marketing and training professional with 16 plus years of exposure in life sciences healthcare and pharma if i talk about his educational background then he has completed his b pharm from jadavpur university and had done his m pharm in pharmaceutical chemistry from the jadavpur university as well he earned his phd from university of the pacific stockton usa specialization in pharmaceutical and chemical sciences program bioanalytical and physical chemistry dr mukherjee yes i'm here sir all right so thank you prita for your kind introduction i believe uh, you are watching my full screen am i right yes sir okay great so uh good morning uh ladies and gentlemen welcome to my uh, webinar today entitled as hplc calm chemistry a primer now this webinar is intended for the people who know a bit basics of hplc uh if you attended my previous webinar attend uh, organized by jis university you know what i'm talking about but if anyway let's get it started so when you talk about um the heart of the system a uh, system like hplc or high performance liquid chromatography or uhplc or ultra high performance liquid chromatography the heart is the column now this column has something uh some particles that is called stationary phase now the column chemistry is obviously dependent on several factors as you see in this slide the first thing first is the base material then we talk about carbon load end capping pore size and surface area if you see i have circled in red three parameters which are column dimensions particle size and particle shape now why these are excluded from column chemistry because these are physical parameters which i'm not going to talk about here so as far as the column chemistry is concerned then how come pore size part of column chemistry now although it is a physical parameter it turns out pore size can actually control the column chemistry i'll talk about it uh, a few slides later so now let's see what we can do with the base material the base material may be of different types like we see here silica alumina poly dr shumit it's an yes. yeah it's an interruption sorry uh, can you can you make the ppt to full screen it's not oh, it, it's not full screen yeah it's on oh. youtube just a moment please you just play it yeah i'm just playing it but um f5 yes i did yeah. no not from there just a moment no, no, just a moment so you need to press f5 no no i did that uh just a moment please 
Did it do? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Do you see my full screen right now? Back the, again, back to that screen. Okay, hang on, please. You see my yeah. full screen? Uh -huh. yes, Great. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. So, the next one uh, I was talking about uh, the base material. Now, silica is the most popular base material. Why? Because it, as you can see, it has got several advantages in terms of physical strength. It's pretty high. You can actually modify the surface, which is also very high. It is older bonded phase particle platform. And the swelling or shrinkage problem is minimum over here, but it has got a potential problem. For basic compounds, you know, compounds may be neutral, acidic, or basic. For basic compounds, it can give rise to broad tailing peaks, especially in the pH range of four to eight. And it has got also poor particle stability problem at a pH which is more than seven. On the other hand, as far as the pH range is concerned, for alumina and polymer, you got broad pH range, but they have some disadvantages compared to silica as you see over here. So that is why silica is a preferred material for reverse phase column chemistry. Next parameter is the pore size. Now, I have shown a table over here where analytical molecular weight is presented and pore size is recommended. Now, we need to keep one thing in mind, pore size is never like a size. You cannot make all pore size identical. Like, I mean, you cannot make all pores identical. So they will be in a range, as you see from this table right here. And normally for drug compounds where you have analyte molecular weight, typically less than 3000, the pore size of 60 to 125 angstrom is all we recommend. But in a pore, you get to see some particular chemistry right here. The compound and the part of the compound is called silanol or silicon bonded with hydroxyl group. Now we'll see in a jiffy what that does. So most silica gel packing are porous. Previously, we have used non-porous particles, but nowadays it's not the case because of several advantages of porous particles. Why? Because pore is the part of your particle where the chromatography happens. More than 99% of the surface area is contained within the particle. It doesn't happen on the surface. So that is why pore size is so important. And the rule of thumb is the smaller the pore size, the greater the surface area. It's pure physics, nothing to do about, about chemistry. But if you go for more surface area, so the greater the surface area, the greater the retention, and therefore you can expect a better resolution. So that's why the chemistry is correlated with the pore size. Now let's take a look at the surface of the silica gel. Now, if we talk about normal phase chemistry, what is normal phase chemistry? In normal phase chemistry, your stationary phase is relatively polar and your mobile phase is relatively non-polar. So, in this surface, as you see, there are two types of groups right here. One is what we call siloxane bond. This SIOSI bond is the siloxane bond, which is pretty much the part of the base. But you see a lot of groups over here that is called surface silanol groups. This silicon followed by hydroxyl group. Now this group is a potential problem especially in case of basic compounds. We'll see in the next slide why that is. Okay, before I talk about silanol group, let's see how many silanol groups are possible. It turns out silanol group chemistry is fairly uh, diversified. You can see vicinal, 
groups where you have one silicon followed by hydroxyl group and another silicon followed by hydroxyl group and they may be connected to dot bonds over here that is what we call hydrogen bond uh, i believe somebody took over the screen right here sartak yes so your screen is not showing it's not sure. Stop presenting. Yes, sir. It's not present. Okay. Let yeah. me just do it once again. Uh, okay. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, Maji, sir, you need to. Uh, now you can. Now you can. I can? Okay. Yeah. Does it work now? No? No, you but share, you start no. sharing. Yes, I, I, okay, hang on. I think I have to start sharing once again. Does it yes, show up? It yes, it's yeah, coming, it's great. coming. Yeah. Yes, okay. it's on. Great. So I was talking about vicinal silanol groups. So vicinal silanol groups can be connected to a hydrogen bond and therefore they're pretty much stable. So they do not pose problems as much as what we call lone selenols. These are the most active selenols. However, we get to see another type of selenol, which is called geminal selenol, where you have two different hydroxyl groups connected to the same silicon atom. But the lone one, which does not have any connection to any other group so that this group cannot be stabilized, this group can ionize itself depending on different parameters and therefore it poses a potential problem, especially in case of the basic compounds. Oh, my slide is not moving, so let me just see. It's not moving. Okay. Okay. So as you see from this equation, when we have a pH of two, we are talking about pH of the mobile phase of the solvent that we use in case of HPLC. So if our pH is close to two, silicon hydroxyl group, which is silanol, remains as it is. But if pH goes, like if it pH typically exceeds three and goes up to pH seven, Silicon hydroxyl or silanol group typically tends to get ionized and forms a negatively charged species. And that causes the problem. We'll see that in the next slide. Now we are looking at what we call mixed mode retention. So when we have a pH less than three, silanol remains as silanol. And therefore, in presence of a basic compound, we don't have any problem. This basic compound, which you see right here, the plus charge in the basic compound, that typically does not pose any problem to the silanol group. But if your pH exceeds three, your silanol, as we have seen in the previous slide, tends to get ionized. And these silanol ion and the basic compound positive charge tend to interact with each other. This is what we call ion exchange interaction with charge sites. And therefore, typically this particular interaction competes with hydrophobic interaction with the bonded phase and your peak tends to tail and your picture goes bad, which you don't like. And uh, obviously it causes problem in your chromatograph. Now, the next one. You may question over here, okay, if I exceed pH three, then I'm getting a bad peak or a poor peak shape, right? But then why we cannot run at a pH less than three? Let's, let's try to run at pH two, which is good, right? Well, it may not be good for some of the compounds. As you see, if we try to separate two compounds, two basic compounds, nortriptyline and amitriptyline at pH two, they do not have virtually any resolution. They do not get separated.
but at pH 7, they're well separated. And that is why sometimes to get resolution, you have to go for higher pH, which may cause big shape problem. So to improve pig shape, people try to do something what you call adding the carbon load. So what we have done, we simply make the selenol interact. We try to synthesize a compound by making it interact with some particular compound called chlorosilin right here, what you see. And hydrochloric acid group gets eliminated and you see a compound which is called carbon loaded selenol. Now, what it does, okay, before I talk about what it does, let's see how many differentiated things we get over here. We can get a carbon 18 bonds. This is typically known as in chemistry like octadecyl silen. We can also have a carbon load of chain of eight. We can have phenyl, biphenyl, phenyl hexyl, amino, cyano, C4, C1, C30, and many others indeed. So why we vary all those? Because we try to improve our cryptography. Let's see how we do that. So first thing first, if we do, let's say for example, introduce a C8 group right here. So you see that C8 is bonded. Now, although you bond many different hydroxyl groups with C8, but still you get to see free selenol groups, which will still cause telling in the peak shape, which means what? we cannot actually bond all the free selenol groups in practice. So how C8 or C18 or any other carbon load offers the protection of this selenol group from its interaction with the basic compound? One word, steric hindrance. The steric hindrance is the thing that is actually preventing the interaction between the basic compound and the selenol group, as you see in this pore right here. It is pretty large, and they are actually physically hiding selenol groups, which is preventing the interaction. Now, you may want to do a secondary bonding. Why? Because I mentioned, we still have unreacted selenol sites. So how do we take care of those? We simply cover those after first step bonding of primary ligand, let's say C18. So we, we use some small selects to reduce selenol activity. But these things also got potential problem. These things tend to hydrolyze quickly at pH less than two, which we have to keep in mind. If you see this chemistry right here, we get to see C8 groups bonded here, as well as the small bonding, which is called secondary bonding, the small silens. These small silens are the secondary bonding that are preventing the interaction between silenol group and the basic compound. So these are the things which you call end capping because it is capping the end of the selenol groups to reduce the interaction. So see what is happening when we have a pH which is pretty low. It is possible your secondary bonding as well as primary bonding can get hydrolyzed, which is bad because your selenol will now be exposed and your chromatography will go bad. So that is the reason why pH control in chromatography is so important. Now, what do you get to see here? We get to see the silica surface bonded with primary bonding like C8, C8 alkyl chains over here. Then we have end capping, which is secondary bonding, but we still have residual selenol. The thing to note over here is that 50% of the surface selenol still remain even with high bonding densities. That means you cannot stop the interaction between selenol groups and the basic compound completely. 
<clears throat> okay, so what you're gonna do if we get a poor pig shape? What we are going to do is that we live with detailing of basic compounds and use mobile phase modifiers like some of the acid based compounds to improve pig shape by controlling the pH. These are old generation technologies. Previously, in 1970s and 1980s, we used to do that. We used to control our peak shape by controlling the mobile phase modifiers. However, nowadays, like 1990s and beyond, the reverse phase particle technology has been used to decrease the undesirable silicon, uh, I'm sorry, silicon interactions. So let's see how we do that. So first thing first, we can improve the silica gel manufacturing process by itself. That means I'm talking about free silica without any carbon load or secondary bonding or end capping. We can try to prepare silica in such a way it becomes more and more pure and it gets rid of some of the potential contaminants like metals to improve the silica quality. So as you see, they have started with precipitation of sodium silicate, which is pretty much old. And then they have gone for salt gel process where we have colloidal silica spheres fused into chromatographic particle. But nowadays we tend to use more pure silence, which is polymerized to form chromatographic particle. So what happens when metals are present on silica gel surface. Metals are bad because your hydroxyl group right here, which is connected to silicon, typically known as silanol group, these one can get ionized in presence of a metal like aluminum just by a theory called Bronsted acid interaction. So ionization is still possible in presence of a metal and that is why you need to reduce the metal content in the silica. How do we do that? We simply purify the silica gel. Another technology to improve the pig shape. So you have seen C8 or C18 side chain. In this side chain, if we now introduce a polar group, as you see over here, some group called carbamate, NHCOO group. This group is in chemistry is known as carbamate group. This group typically can do a hydrogen bonding with a water molecule. That means it can attract a water molecule by hydrogen bonding. And therefore it can reduce the hydrophobicity of the column. This means it can reduce the retention of basic compounds and therefore also reduce the peak tailing because this water molecule right here is now working like a cap to the ionized silanol group. And therefore it prevents the interaction between the basic compound and silanol group. The next chemistry is about a typical hybrid chemistry. Now, we remember that we have done something called primary bonding like C8 or C18, secondary bonding with small silence, but we can also try to improve by changing a part of it by introducing one methyl group. So in the, in the picture down here, what you see, one third has been replaced by small silence, one third is still free, and another third is contributed by the introduction of metal groups. Now these are replacing basically your cellular groups to improve the peak shape. So this is what I call a hybrid chemistry. And in this hybrid chemistry, the cellular interaction gets reduced to improve your peak shape. Another challenge right here. We can actually change the cellular groups by doing some synthesis to introduce a group called a breezed ethylene group. If you introduce a breezed ethylene group like CH2CH2 group in the silica base, you can actually improve 
trend of the silica because it is pretty much bonded, it's not free. It can improve the pH range, improve efficiency, and therefore also improve peak shape. So this is another success story as far as hybrid chemistry is concerned. You can also apply controlled surface charge to improve sample loadability and peak asymmetry. What is peak asymmetry? Is basically, you know, a bad peak shape, but the peak shape is not typically what you call a Gaussian peak shape. So in low ion strength mobile phase, we can improve sample loadability by applying a controlled surface charge on the silica gel particle. Okay. Success story continues. We have got many different types of chemistry in our hand right now. One example is that PFP reverse phase. What does it do? It, this PFP is nothing but pentafluorophenol. So if you have some fluorine atoms introduced, they can actually help charge wise and therefore Aromatic isomers or halogenated or polar compounds can be analyzed by using pentafluorophenol reverse phase chemistry. You can also have polar end cap reverse phase where you have polar analytes or highly aqueous mobile phase that can be handled by using this chemistry. The next example is porous graphite carbon reverse phase. This offers an alternative selectivity. Let's remember getting an alternative selectivity is important. Typically, how we understand selectivity? Selectivity is the sequence of different peaks. So sometimes we, we, we cannot resolve some peaks. We try to resolve peaks by changing the selectivity or sequence of different peaks. So that is what for us, graphite carbon reverse space can do to offer an alternative selectivity. The next example is helic chemistry. This is another very popular chemistry because it can help analyze polar hydrophilic compounds. Let's remember when you're talking about a carbon load onto your silica gel surface, we are talking about reverse phase chemistry where we have stationary phase as non-polar and mobile phase as relatively polar. So in this particular stationary phase, analyzing polar hydrophilic compound is very difficult. So we try to take help of helic chemistry or hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. This hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography can help analyze polar hydrophilic compounds. A polar hydrophilic compounds can also be analyzed by an alternative chemistry, which is called amide chemistry. This is obviously offering an alternative selectivity for your polar compounds, polar hydrophilic compound specifically. Now, mixed mode HPLC columns are also available nowadays. RP stands for reverse phase and IEX stands for ion exchange and helic, you know, hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. So, Ionic and hydrophobic analytes, what if they're present both? So you have got some neutral compounds, like they are more hydrophobic, and they have, you have got some charged compounds, they're like ionic. In a single phase, like you have a mixture of those compounds. So without column switching or ion pairing or using columns in syringe, how do we do that? Because switching a column, a pain then iron pairing can give rise to certain advantages, but they also have potential disadvantages. And if you try to use column in series, it not only increases cost, but it can also pose certain hardware related and uh, you know, chemistry related issues. So we now have a column chemistry that is called mixed mode column chemistry, which can handle that kind of situation. The last but not the least, ligand exchange. Ligand exchange is offered by polymer column chemistry. Here, typically we try to analyze carbohydrates, which are very difficult to analyze by reverse phase column chemistry, but here you can do by using dilute acid mobile phase. So we have got 
many different success stories to handle our column chemistry. So now let's see how, how it looks like in reality. So if you have acidic compounds, for example, we have got to see some acidic compounds over here and you have, you're using same brand, but different ligand. So you have got some particular brand, let's say any, any vendor, any typical vendor that you know of, but you are using two different ligands, let's say C8 versus C18. So C8 and C18 will offer similar selectivity because they have same silica particle. The only difference is in the side chain, which is carbon load. When you have C18, obviously the retention is higher as you see in this particular chromatogram. What if we handle, let's say neutral compounds and same brand using different ligand densities? So now silica gel, same, carbon load, same, but we are using different ligand densities. ODS or octatesylcelene, that C8, C18 chain. The C18 chain in one case, the density is low because you have done certain synthesis, synthesis for your compound. And then the second thing is ODS is high. If ODS is high, obviously it will give rise to higher retention because it is more hydrophobic. So different hydrophobicities can offer similar selectivity, but different runtime. Acidic compounds, two different C18s. Now we change the brands, but the ligand remains the same let's say C8 or C18. In this particular example, we're using C18 or ODS. But let's remember when you're changing brand, the column chemistry may be different, may be quite different. And therefore different brands, let's say, you know, you are using a Waters column and then you come up with a Tom Fisher scientific column or an Agilent column or whatever, you know, Shimatsu column, whatever you are using, you can get to see different selectivity for different brands. As you see in this particular example, ketoprofen and tomatin. These two compounds are kind of, you know, merged over here when you're using brand B, but in brand A, they're getting some resolution. So in one case, you may get some success, in other cases, you may not, and different selectivities can happen and that is happening because the different silica particles is used when you are using different brands. The next part is again, different C18. Now we are using basic compounds. Sometimes your selectivity may not go wrong. Selectivity is perfect. You are able to resolve your peaks, but one peak shape may go bad because again, when you are using different brands, they are made of different silica particles and they may have different selenol behaviors. Let's keep that in mind, it's very important. Different selenol behaviors for different brands. And therefore, for in this particular example, as you see, amitriptyline, although it is showing good in one case, in other case, the pig shape is completely a disaster. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, we have also have to note that when you are talking about column chemistry, we also have to keep pH of the mobile phase in mind because pH plays a significant role in peak shape. Even if your column chemistry is doing good, but your peak shape may go bad because probably using some pH, which is not compatible with your with your chemistry and therefore your big shape is going bad. So let's come back to that metal example. I mentioned that metals are bad when it's present in the silica base. You can see in this example, when metals are present, let's say metal, metal is present over here uh, in, in this particular compound, okay? The Henriketal, this particular example. So when you actually have metallic compounds like your sample or your analyte, your interaction with that metal, interaction of the metal with 
the stationary phase may cause a potential problem and your big shape may go bad. So analyzing some compound having a metal with some silica based particle, which is the stationary phase, may pose difficulty. So what do you see in different, uh, different pH ranges? We see between pH 2 and 8, we have potential problem, especially for the conventional C18 or C8, uh, C8 chemistry. So if you have low ligand density, ligand density means we are talking about the side chain, and or high metal content in the silica gel, then your big shape can be bad in the range of pH two to eight. As you see in the pH two to three, range of pH two to three, it is not as bad. But when it is exceeding pH three and going up to eight, your, your tailing factor or the tailing of the pH, I'm sorry, tailing uh, of the peak is going different. But for modern C18 columns, because we are using high ligand density, that means the carbon load is very high, and at the same time, we're using high purity silica. We do not have as much problem as we have seen in case of conventional C80 columns. So ideal behavior of pure polymer is no selenols because polymers do not have selenols. But as you know, polymers can also have certain disadvantages. So we try to stick to silica, improving its column chemistry over the time. So I have been talking about poor peak shape all the time. What's so wrong with poor peak shape? I mean, does it really matter when you talk about method development? Yes, it does. If you see the poor peak shape in this particular chromatogram over here, it can actually give rise to integration errors. Now, integration is something which is very important when you're talking about quantification or quantitation of your peak, because if your integration goes wrong, your quantitation goes wrong as well. Poor peak shift can give rise to reduced resolution because they are not well separated now. At the same time, a poor peak shift can also give rise to reduced sensitivity. Think about it, just Gaussian peak shift, like a triangle. If the triangle height goes down, obviously the width goes up. So that's why it can give rise to reduce sensitivity. Okay, so thank you very much for patiently listening to this particular topic. And thanks goes to Jules University, uh, especially to Professor Mangshu Shekhar Maji, who invited me in this particular seminar. And thanks for organizing a nice, virtual international colloquium and inviting me and giving me an opportunity to present this particular topic. So this session is now open to questions. Thank you so much, sir. We'll be taking questions now. Any of the participants can unmute themselves and question sir directly. So we have a question from our, our YouTube live. Um, Dr. Nidhi is asking you, what is purity threshold? Okay, so basically purity can't depend on many, many different things, as I mentioned, you know, like the purity of the silica gel. Normally, if you see that uh, aluminum content, uh, especially aluminum content, can give rise to differentiation in purity, uh, we have to be very careful about differing purity over here because it is not only alumina that can give rise to silica gel purity, uh, but we know typically if pH3 exceeds, then we get to see cellular based problems. So purity threshold typically starts at around pH3. 
but we have to keep in mind there may be several other factors. Thank you, sir. So we have another question. It goes like, uh, how do we set the traditional peak width? How do we understand that? What is the traditional peak width? Okay. Um, there is no hard and fast rule for the peak width indeed. Now, as we know in a peak, if you can make it less broad, your sensitivity can actually increase. So that is the goal. If we can keep our peak less broad, our sensitivity will increase and that can also help in resolution. Because if your peak, uh, peak width decreases, if you have a neighboring peak, then of course resolution can be improved. Thank you, sir. So if any other question comes, we'll directly 